What's up, guys? Tonight I wanted to give just a really, um, hopefully brief overview of budget night vision options. And I say that with quotation marks because really when you're talking about night vision, it's there's no way around it. It's not going to be cheap. You're going to be spending thousands of dollars um, to use night vision effectively. Um, and that's, that's just what it's going to be. Um, and budget is a relative term for some people that might not sound like a lot of money for me, it has been, and I've spent years getting what I have here, um, and getting to the point where I ha I'm fairly happy with my setup. Obviously there's a lot of stuff I can improve and would like to improve in the future, but, uh, at least I have this, uh, fairly functional and I can train with it and uh, improve with it and learn from it. So right off the bat, um, just for beginners, there's different types of night vision, there's different generations, and there's different um, housings. There's uh, typically Gen 1, 2, and 3 of night vision for a real, um, a, a solid setup, a, a setup that you're going to want to use. You're going to want to get uh, Gen 3, which is what this PBS 14 right here is. Uh, the Gen 2 Plus, I, I do know guys that have some of the Gen 2 Plus tubes. Um, they do have good performance as well, but they can struggle a little bit more in low light situations. Uh, extremely low ambient light situations is mainly where they struggle. Um, so uh, my recommendation is you're going to want to stick with a Gen 3 tube. Um, so you, you do have uh, monoculars like this, which is obviously just one tube. You're going to be looking through it with one eye. You have dual tubes, which is there will be another tube over here. You'll be using both eyes. Uh, dual tubes are pretty obviously a superior setup, but they're also pretty drastically more expensive. There is some advantages to a single tube in that your offhand eye is uh, gauging your ambient light conditions and stuff like that, but generally dual tubes are considered pretty obviously superior. Um, so you're looking for your first night vision device. Depending on your budget, a PBS 14 like this is probably going to be what you're looking for. They can run from anywhere from uh, $1,500 for a used one to $4,500 for a super high-spec uh, white phosphorus tube. Uh, so depending on your budget, you're going to have to figure out what you're looking for there. There is a lot of specs that determine um, the clarity, the the uh the brightness and everything like that of the tube and there's a lot of videos on uh, youtube and places other places that really do a good job of talking about that and i'm really not a great expert on that so i'm going to let you find other sources to determine what specs are important to you and what you're looking for in your tube but that is something you're going to want to educate yourself on before you buy your tube um, the next thing you're going to want to do is make sure that you buy a from a reputable seller. There is a lot of Facebook pages where you can buy um, used tubes or even buy new tubes from smaller uh, distributors. You just need to be cautious with that. You need to make sure you understand how to protect yourself when you do those kind of purchases and just be wary of that. Some good, uh, a good go-to place is TNVC. They're kind of, they've been the guy, big guys in the industry for a long, long time. You're going to pay a little bit more for their um, for their name, but uh, but that's kind of their the big name in the industry right now. Um, there is a lot of other great retailers out there, but that's another thing you just need to do your own research on. So let's say you found your PBS 14 or whatever uh, night vision device you decided to buy. Uh, if you're like me, you found a good deal on a night vision device. You bought it and you were like, oh, I do not have a way to use this. I don't have a helmet. I don't have a mount, anything like that. And a night vision device just isn't very much fun to use when you're just walking around holding it up to your face. So that's one thing you're going to need to understand when you buy this is you're going to need to budget for all the accessories that go with it. So the first thing you're going to need is a helmet of some type. This is a bump helmet, depending on your needs and your uses. You can get a ballistic helmet or a bump helmet. A bump helmet is literally what it says. It just offers protection from bumps. Essentially a glorified skateboard helmet. Opscore and Team Wendy are kind of the, the, the big boys, the big name brands in that industry. 
This is a Team Wendy. Um, and then if you're looking at ballistic, again, there's a lot of that lot that goes into that. And uh, again, that's something you're going to need to do some research on and determine for yourself. But with that helmet, you're going to need an arm and a mount. Uh, Wilcox is definitely the, pretty much the go-to. Um, but there are two different kinds of mounts. So this is actually a bayonet mount, meaning that this is the bayonet arm. And this is kind of what the uh, kind of an older mounting style, but it's much more affordable. These are, you can get a, a bayonet arm for uh, around like 30, 40 bucks on eBay, or at least you could when I bought mine. And then this is a Wilcox G11, which is essentially a Wilcox G24 mount, but it accepts uh, a bayonet mounting style. This is not um, as good as a dovetail system, which is what a Wilcox G24 with a dovetail mount would do. The dovetail is much more secure in its lockup, much less wiggle, definitely just a better system. But again, if we're talking about budget, um, this is what I've what I'm running currently. Uh, you can just get an old school USGI Rhino, but those do when you flip that up. You're, I mean, you're 14 is sitting like way up here, and if you're ever planning to upgrade to duels in the future, you're definitely going to want a Wilcox G24. So that's something you're going to need to budget for. Those G24 arms are four to five hundred dollars um, just for this piece here. Um, so that's something you're needed to budget for. Uh, basically what this arm does though, is it's going to allow you to one, flip your device down, but you're going to be able to adjust it. You can adjust your tilt here. You can slide your, uh, device up and down here and slide it in back and forth from your eye here. So it's very important to have a good mount like that, that gives you plenty of adjustment so that you can actually have that device where you need it in front of your eye. So a good helmet and arm and mount is something you're going to need to budget for. Um, back here we have an IR strobe. This is IR strobes really aren't that important in my opinion for uh, typical civilian use, but they've been coming handy enough that I still keep mine on here. We use it um, when hunting when hiking in the woods, just stuff like that. Just so like, hey, if you're going over on that hilltop, I can see you really easily if you've got an IR strobe on here. And again, if you're talking about budget options, this is a um, MS2000 strobe. Again, it's an older design, pretty cheap and affordable. Um, at least it was, again, when I bought mine. When you set your helmet up, you're gonna want some kind of counterweight to balance out the weight of that 14 sitting forward on your head. So it's just another thing to take into account. You can get cheaper counterweights, you can get expensive counterweights, you could take some lead and slap it on the back of your uh, helmet with some Velcro and that'll work too. Uh, but it's just, you know, all your budget and how you wanna do things. And then you're gonna need some ear pro to go with that helmet. You can just use earplugs, but it's really nice to have this active hearing protection on here. So just another thing to take into consideration. If you buy your whatever your night vision device is and you're like, crap, I can't afford a helmet right now, you can get skull crushers. This is a uh, cry nightcap. And essentially it takes the place of a helmet, just has a shroud in the front, and you can take this arm right here and you can lock that whoops, into your nightcap and it'll just go right on your head just like that. Now you're gonna look like a freaking goober, um, and this is not a super comfortable setup. I've run this for a few hours at a time, but it was not great. I would not recommend it. Um, but if you're looking for a really budget option or a super compact option, that could be it for you. Fits right in a cargo pocket. Um, Another thing you might want to look at is just getting a protective cap for this end of your night vision. Again, you need to educate yourself on night vision and how it works and what's going to protect your night vision. But basically, you want to protect the objective lens of your night vision because that's how you're going to develop lens from uh, bright lights and stuff like that. So, so you've got your 14, you've got your mount, you've got your helmet or your nightcap, you've got ear protection, you're ready to start shooting with your night vision. So there's several options you can go with here. You can do passive aiming, which is 
aiming just th straight through an optic um, with your night vision. And as you can see here, I've got this RMR mounted up on top of my ACOG. Um, and this is a great option for passive aiming. Passive aiming is basically just aiming through your optic like you would during the day, but with your night vision. There's a couple things you need to be aware of. You're going to need, not necessarily need, but it makes it a much easier to use night vision if you have an optic that's quite high over your bore, just to allow that to uh, allow you to get your head behind it, essentially. If you have a lower sitting red dot, it's just really hard to get that 14 down behind it. Um, so the higher it is, the easier it is, but then you're also dealing with that offset. So you need to train that and understand that. Another thing you need to be aware of is that optic needs to be night vision compatible. If you have a optic that's just really bright, you're still going to be able to look through it with your night vision, but it's probably going to be a really blown out image and it could end up burning your tube. So you need to be careful with that and be aware of that. Um, passive aiming is a great option for some scenarios. Uh, unfortunately, for a lot of stuff that I do, I live way out in the middle of nowhere, like very low ambient light conditions, no, no uh, light pollution from nearby cities or anything like that. So a lot of times I'm finding that even for passive aiming, I'm needing some kind of um, illumination, IR illumination, because night vision only amb or, uh, amplifies ambient light. It doesn't create light. It's just taking the light that's there and amplifying it. So if there's no light to amplify, it's, it's still not going to work great. It's not going to, you're not going to see much. So if that's the case, you're going to want to have some kind of illumination. Um, so that, that brings you into your light and laser setups on your rifles. So I've got two different setups here. Try and get them both in frame here. Um, first of all, as you can see, both rifles are running Surefire M300 Vampire lights. What this light is, is it allows you to click between a white light, your center is just an off, nothing. And then the third setting is an IR flood, which you can't see, but you would through your night vision. Um, what that allows you to do is have that IR light that can't be seen with the naked eye, but can be seen with the night vision for those low ambient light conditions. Um, and at least for where I shoot, it's almost essential. Without this, you're just not, I mean, at 30 yards, you can barely see a steel target. So, um, and again, with higher spec tubes and, uh, you know, just better conditions, you 100% don't need to, a supplemental IR light all the time. But in some situations, it's definitely necessary. So I like having that option on here. Um, tying in with that, you have your IR lasers. So here we've got an app PLC. Uh, the APLC has a IR laser, a visible laser, and an IR illuminator on board. Now you might be thinking, well, if it's already got an IR illuminator on board, why do you need this uh, Surefire on here with the IR? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of civilian lasers have pretty poor IR illuminators just because they're, they're forced to be lower power to meet the, uh, the standards. Um, so... Even though this app PLC has an IR illuminator on board, it's poor enough that I was forced to add this to have that uh, supplemental IR illumination. So the way I'm running this one is I do have just a dual switch button. Uh, uh, shoot, I can't remember if there's the mod button back here. Um, so when I am shooting, if I want my white light, I can just run that like that or I can come around with a dual button here and run it that way. Or when I'm going to my, um, my night vision, I can switch this over to my IR. I can swap my laser on and this button will turn on this illumination and this laser and the uh, supplemental IR illumination on this all at the same time. So I'm, I've been a big fan of that setup and uh, it's, you've got essentially the same setup over here on this rifle. Over here, again, Surefire Vampire. This is a Steiner Otal, so this is only an IR laser. So again, that it, this becomes even more essential, this Surefire Illuminator on here with that, because this is only a laser, not an illuminator. And then behind that, I have Unity Taps, um, and that allows me to just activate my illuminator, white light, or IR with the front button, 
and then the rear would be my illuminator here and my laser here with one button push. So that's another thing that I think is very important with, um, with your rifle setup is that if you are running a supplemental illuminator, you're going to want to be able to turn your laser and illuminator on with one button. Um, and another thing that I find is I think is very important is being able to have tertiary options for running both things. So here, if my tape switch fails, I can still run this with my tail cap. And then obviously if the tape switch fails on the laser, I do have the activation button on top. Um, over here, I don't have a tertiary for my illuminator, but I do have just a, a switch on the back of the laser for that. And then again, you have your passive aiming options back here at the back of the rifle um, for that as well. So that a big part of night vision and a big part of something a lot of people don't understand is even though this device in itself is quite expensive, um, it's really just the beginning of the expenses of night vision. If I can get this off here. Um, but yeah, so you're going to you buy purchase your unit. You're going to have to get your helmet. You need your arm. Uh, if you want to shoot with it, you're going to have to have illuminators, lasers, uh, night vision compatible red dots. You might need risers for your red dots, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, there's no, there's not really going to be a real budget option. You can do it in an affordable way uh, for most people, but it might take some time. Uh, I'm probably going on five years now of slowly building up my stuff to where I need it to be. Um, so then another thing, once you get to this point, is you're going to want to focus on reducing your signature at night. A big part of that's going to be a suppressor. Um, if you're using any kind of compensators that throw a big ball of flame uh, when you're shooting at night, that's not going to be great. You're going to blind your own night vision and you're going to be throwing your location out to everyone else out there. So a good suppressor with good flash reduction is important. Um, honestly, just bird cages do a pretty good job as well. And then also you're going to want to start looking at the kind of materials that you're wearing and your rigs are and stuff like that because everything has a different look under IR. So some stuff will actually, an unpainted rifle will often appear shiny and will reflect IR light like crazy. Um, sometimes helmets will. So I have a helmet cover on here in addition to this scrim, which is spray painted. So it's a very matte and, and uh, subdued look under night vision. Um, but that's something else you're going to want to look into as you get uh, your, your device and start using it. But really the biggest thing is once you get this, no matter what you have, whether you're holding it with your hand, throwing it on a nightcap, throwing it on your helmet, you just got to get out there and use it. Um, I've seen a lot of guys with duels that haven't used it enough to really even, I mean, they can barely stumble around in the dark. If you get enough hours behind your PVS-14, you, you'll be leaps and bounds ahead of those guys. Um, and a lot of times guys talk a lot of crap down on people that have just a 14. It's like, oh, well, you know, get, just get some duels, you poor. But uh, as long as you are putting in the work to use your device to the best of your abilities, uh, that's really what's important, not the rest of this stuff. Um, I mean, you can, again, someone with, that is trained enough with their stuff can 100% outshoot a guy with just an illuminator and passive aiming than a guy with the, the fanciest new laser or anything like that. Um, but yeah, this is kind of just scratching the surface of night vision. Again, this is kind of just a little night vision for beginners um, and somewhat budget look at it just to kind of prepare you if you're looking at night vision for kind of the hole that you're about to drop down. Because like I said, it's, it's one thing after another just basically to be able to use it to its full potential. So I hope this helped you guys. Um, I'd love to do more specialized looks into stuff if that's something that would be helpful to you guys uh, if that's the case let me know i would definitely love to do that but uh, until next time train hard guys we'll see you out there